So, to continue, this is part six. Um, to continue from the end of uh, my previous little 15-minute uh, talk, um, I'm still exactly where I was at the start of those 15 minutes, uh, wondering uh, what it is that is theatrical that would have controlled um, my powers of invention or submission to the goddess of theater at the time of uh, beginning that play with its uh, startling title given to me by somebody else, Midget in a cat suit reciting Spinoza. You can imagine if you'd ask somebody to put together a sentence that was almost <laughs> without promise as the premise for a story. They couldn't have done better. So there I was, as every playwright uh, has been, including the greatest uh, playwrights, facing uh, the promptings, awaiting the promptings, uh, facing the darkness, but awaiting the promptings of the god of theatre, the goddess of theatre. Uh, where next? Where now? Start where? Um, I think it's particularly interesting we ought to consider this, that from the very earliest of plays uh, that form in effect our history of theatre, uh, from the beginning of the Agamemnon by Aeschylus, we do not start the story uh, in the High King's chamber. We do not start uh, the story in the company of the High King and Queen. Um, it's Aeschylus's unerring uh, uh, sense of how theatrical stories should start. It's astonishing that he had no difficulty uh, letting this flow through uh, his imagination from the, as yet, in a sense, unborn muse, uh, that you start on the ground uh, with little people, with little, with, uh, with uh, uh, a domestic level of storytelling. In the case of the Agamemnon, uh, it's the watchman uh, lying on a roof who has been uh, uh, symbolically at least watching uh, now uh, for 10 years uh, for a, the lighting of a bonfire which would have been lit all around the eastern Mediterranean to declare that Troy had fallen. And of course we find him at the moment when, in fact, Troy has fallen and he sees the bonfire, 10 years of waiting. So we are uh, imposing from the get-go uh, a coincidence of, uh, of astounding proportions. Uh, it, it happens just to be the moment. We have come to the moment. Uh, we are creating this story out of the moment when an ordinary person is hurled into history. And out of that encounter will come uh, the words and the presence of the High King and Queen. But we begin uh, on the ground floor. And this was understood to be necessary and correct, and when we moved on to Sophocles, uh, the Antigone begins uh, with the two sisters, Antigone and Ismene, not with King Creon and his pronouncements which cause uh, the horrible uh, proceedings of the play, but rather with two of the people reading his pronouncement. They have read the pronouncements as uh, put up maybe, uh, or put, put about uh, verbally, um, in the town square, and they're consulting each other. Did you hear? Did you see? Much the same thing happens at the start of King Lear, uh, where two uh, attendant lords uh, come on, uh, alerting us to the fact that, that they are at, about to attend uh, a fateful meeting where the king will decide which of two suitors, uh, Burgundy and France, uh, should have the hand of his youngest daughter. And so they come on uh, saying to each other, I thought he was leaning towards France, but I, I'm now beginning to wonder if it's Burgundy. And the other person is saying, no, no, you see, he's leaning towards Burgundy so that he'll fool us and it'll be France. And there are two punters talking about, uh, you know, which horse to back, rather like the opening song of Guys and Dolls. 
I got the horse right here. His name is Paul Revere. Um, a wonderful song called Fugue for Tin Horns, uh, which opens Guys and Dolls in a typical place where ordinary people were. So uh, that instinct, which seems to have gripped the first of playwrights and the last of playwrights, I mean, there we are with Hamlet. Do we start in the great hall with the king discussing uh, uh, the death of his brother? Not at all. We start on the battlements where shivering guards, for this relief, much thanks, are discussing something else, the appearance of a ghost on the battlements. Of course, this, the appearance of the ghost has enormous re resonance in the story, but we don't start with the ghost or with the king or with Hamlet himself. So uh, sometimes uh, I, I wonder whether th there isn't a practical element in this tradition, which is that people haven't settled down yet. So in uh, on the Shakespearean stage or in the audience, they're still throwing oranges at each other and the occasional duel has, uh, hasn't quite finished. Um, and so the wise playwright will go <coughs> do a bit of throat clearing, dramatically speaking, and, uh, and write a scene that it's not absolutely essential for the audience to get, although it's useful. And in the modern theater, uh, the audiences are expected to have shut up uh, by the time the opening scene gets underway. But there was, there was, I think, an element of practicality about this tradition. But I think it's the first thing we come across as being uh, theatrical in what is possibly an unexpected way. Um, and I'm not sure that it tallies with um, storytelling. Uh, the Iliad doesn't really start with the servants. Um, sing, goddess, uh, the anger of Achilles were promised in the opening line that the goddess who will sing through Homer, this is uh, probably for me the most important thing about that opening line, uh, it's not uh, sing me, <laughs> sing O poet, O harpist, harper, uh, uh, sing uh, to us, uh, uh, I will sing to you about the anger of Achilles. No. No, uh, I'm going to ask the goddess to sing, and I will go into a trance, a shamanic trance, uh, and she will sing through me. It is the goddess, interestingly, of course, uh, it is an extraordinary line that, in, in that it does not say, sing goddess of the fall of Troy, the greatest city of its time. That would have been a perfectly good way to start, but no. Uh, interestingly, we're invited to listen to somebody uh, telling the story of, of rage. That's very interesting. Uh, however, uh, it's not uh, intrinsically theatre. At that point, it's just storytelling. And uh, we're asking ourselves what, what appears on the stage. So um, just as in my little uh, play with its, um, its midget in a cat suit, so it, it, the play starts with an introductory section which... Um, doesn't yet really announce the full story, it just tickles its way in. Uh, so that appears to be theatrical. Uh, theatricality is knowing uh, how to capture your audience's attention and to do so uh, without uh, being too theatrical, <laughs> without making too much of a fuss, of a noise, uh, not the trumpet. Uh, start low, start small, and let the themes grow upon you uh, as uh, the play goes on. So, for me, of course, uh, it's where I've got to in describing uh, my proceeding with, with my particular play or any of my plays. That's the end of it. I know no more. I go into a trance. I fall asleep, so to speak. I wake up, and the play is there uh, written. Of course, it's... It's not quite as fast as that, but in effect, it might as well be. It's only in my sleep that I could write it. Uh, the sleep of my reason, at any rate, uh, and the wakefulness of my, uh, my, 
my loyalty to, my devotion to, my, my servitude uh, to the gods, the goddess uh, of theatre, uh, which has been trained by watching great theatre, uh, which instructed me without my knowing, although now and then you think, oh, that's interesting. Um, as a technician, uh, you're aroused by choices, uh, made successful choices made by the playwright, but most of the time uh, you fall asleep. And when I, the same applies for me when I go to the movies, um, I have to ask my wife what happened. And I have to ask her in the, if I'm going to, in the course of the, of the action, I have to say, wait a minute, have we, see, have we seen this chap before? And, and she says, oh, you, of course you have, you idiot. And she will, she's worked out very soon what the action is, who the bad guy is, who's going to live and who's going to die. Whereas I have subjected myself to the trance of innocent uh, experience. I attend innocently upon the authors every while because it's the wiles that are teaching me. I'm not learning from being a canny audience. Um, you might think I would, that would help me be a better watchmaker when it came to creating a play. But actually, uh, it's not being a watchmaker that you need. Uh, technique, I wrote this over and over uh, when I was starting as a writer, I wrote this down as a, as a duty every day. It's technique follows emotion, uh, wrote I. Uh, as a young writer, meaning that if you were there feeling uh, the possibilities uh, for what might happen to, to these personages, uh, into its wake, into the wake of the force of emotion would flow everything that you had unconsciously learned from watching plays. It's all there, but I don't think you can force it into the foreground any more than you can uh, force storytelling in any narrative form. Uh, on down onto the page, out of your brain. It will come if you feel it deeply enough uh, what the uh, enabling situation is. Uh, maybe even just uh, what the landscape is. Uh, there are many clues uh, to entering a story or at least opening the portal. It's like, uh, it's like finding the underworld. It's probably just round behind that tree or behind that rock is an unexpected doorway uh, down into the plutonic regions. That's how it is uh, when creating a plausible fiction or a fiction that is true uh, to uh, the drive of emotion which will enable people to identify. It's not going to be uh, the cleverness uh, of, the, of the, the, the plotting uh, that will bring people, draw people into the story's lair. Uh, it's actually the emotion, the caring, that is the real inspiration. So, so at, the, at this point uh, where a play starts and where our story starts of theatre evolving as a thing that had a meaning, um, the first thing you had to do uh, was, was surrender your desire to control the proceedings. Uh, because intrinsically inside poetry, as it then was before it became theatre, and Shakespeare was known as a poet, there was no such thing as a playwright, um, inside poetry there was already uh, an embryo, uh, all the forms of storytelling that people were to discover over time, uh, including the dismantling of what passes for a conventional story. That too was foreseen all of it. And we just had to find the right phone number, the right wavelength, uh, find the right submission to it for it to declare itself. So as we proceed, and I realize we haven't got a lot further in these last two uh, little videos, but as we proceed, that's what we're going to investigate. What was it that the goddess had to tell the early playwrights, uh, which is uh, still true so strikingly in the history of theater, Theatre itself as a genre continues to be a journey to the same Apollonian or Dionysian uh, temple, the same one. And there we still find our inspiration and there we still find the meaning of theatre. And there the history of theatre continues to evolve and yet uh, also simply to repeat itself. Uh, so, 
uh, more on this very soon. Once more, I wish you better of the weather than we're having it in the Mount Overlook Wild Forest, where I am very happy to be living. On a day like this, it's rather spectacular with huge flakes of snow. All the best. Lots of love.